I should like to call your attention this evening to the words which are to be found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles in the ninth chapter and the sixth verse. The sixth verse in the ninth chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. In order again to remind you of the setting, and those especially who may not have been here on previous Sunday evenings, <clears throat> let me read the preceding five verses also. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee, what thou must do. We've been considering together on a number of Sunday evenings the great case of the conversion of this mighty man of God uh, to whom we refer as the Apostle Paul. And there in that short, brief compass, in those few verses, we are brought face to face with the great and the essential details of uh, what happened to him and what uh, wrought such a, a great change in this man's life. The thing that turned him from being Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of Christ and of Christianity, into the greatest preacher of the gospel that the church has ever known. We are interested in all this, as I've been saying so constantly, not because we are animated by some mere biographical or antiquarian interest, but because... The scripture itself would have us see and learn that this man's case, this man's conversion, is a pattern, an illustration of what God does to every soul that eventually becomes a Christian. We have the apostle's own authority for that statement. He says that he's just someone who's being held aloft, as it were, that all might look at him and see and know the long-suffering and the patience of Christ. And therefore, I say, we are interested in the whole story, that we may learn from it some of these guiding and fundamental essential principles in connection with this whole matter. I do want to underline and emphasize that, it's a very interesting study in and of itself. Nothing can be more interesting and entrancing than to look at a great life like this and to see this great climactic change and to discover what it was that brought it about. There is no more fascinating study than biography, especially if you look at it from the standpoint of analysis and uh, try to determine and to evaluate the various forces and factors that have made the particular great men whose life you are studying the men that he became. It's very interesting, I say, intriguing. And yet we are uh, looking into this matter <coughs> not for that reason, but rather from a very practical standpoint. The business of the Christian church is to announce and to proclaim to mankind that there is only one hope of peace and of happiness in this world, and it is that which is to be obtained in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is the message of the church, that the world is as it is, because it is estranged from God. 
because it doesn't know God, because it has sinned against God. The world, by nature, and as it is, as the result of the fall of men originally, is in this condition of this man's soul of Tarsus. Obviously, a man in a state of conflict. Conflicting with others, in a state of conflict within himself. <coughs> that is why he is breathing out these threatenings and slaughters. He's an unhappy man. And yet, you see, as the result of this thing which happened to him, he became such an entirely different man. A man to whom we can look up and admire. And as we read about him, surely we must all agree and say, would to God that we were like that man. A man who's mastered life and all its attendant circumstances. A man who can say, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therein to be content. Well, now then, I say, the thing, therefore, we all are concerned about is this. What was it that produced the change? What was it that made the difference? And here we are given the answer, and we've been considering it together. The point I want to make this evening is this, that there are certain things which are always present whenever anybody becomes a true Christian. Every experience that mankind gets is not of necessity Christian. There are people who can testify to great changes in their lives who are not Christian and who say they're not Christian. But they've undergone a great change. We are not interested in changes as such. We are interested in becoming Christian. Becoming what the Apostle Paul came in a Christian sense. And there I say there are certain things that are always present. Of course they're not always present with the same intensity. But they're always there. Now take, for instance, that example which we had in that 16th chapter of this book of the Acts, which we read together at the beginning. Take the case of a woman like Libya. Take the case of the Philippian jailer. They both came to the same place. They both had the same experience. They both became participators in the great, same great Christian salvation. And yet you notice that the circumstances are very different. The case of the Philippian jailer is a very dramatic one, one of the most dramatic of all. There doesn't seem to have been any drama in the case of Lydia. But you see, that's incidental, that's not essential. And yet in the two cases, and in all other cases, there are certain things that are common, that are invariable, and that therefore we must insist upon as being essential to the true Christian experience. And, of course, this must of necessity be the case. The Bible tells us that to become Christian, we all must be what it calls, be born again. We must be regenerated. According to the scripture, this profound change that takes place when one becomes a Christian is the most radical and the most vital thing that can ever happen in a human experience. It isn't a, a mere addition of something to your life. It isn't the mere turning of a corner. It isn't merely that you add something which you haven't got before or put on some kind of clothing. No, according to the scripture, it is as radical and as profound as this, that it is indeed like uh, rising to life from amongst the dead. It's the difference between death and life. It's uh, the thing that happens when a child is born into the world. He wasn't there. He suddenly is in a new world, being born again, regenerated, generated anew and afresh. It's as profound as that. That's the teaching of the Scripture. It tells us that we are all of us, by nature, the children of wrath. We are all of us in a state of sin, and we are all in a state of darkness. And that becoming a Christian, therefore, is something which is entirely new, and which can only be described in some such terms as those I've just been implying. To become a Christian, therefore, is the profoundest thing that can ever happen to anybody. And I say because of that, you would expect, reasonably and logically, that there should be certain common characteristics in all cases. 
Apart from the dramatics, the thing itself is the same. Let me use an illustration and a comparison. This matter can be compared, if you like, in a sense, to an illness. Now, there are many forms of illness. I mean by that there are many different manifestations of an illness. Sometimes you see a man who's ill with a raging, soaring temperature in a wild delirium, and it's obvious to anybody who looks on at him that he's ill. Struggling, perhaps, in the bed, struggling with the bedclothes, unable to remain quiet for a moment. But then you can think of another person who's ill, who's lying quite motionless in the bed. Doesn't have a temperature, certainly is not delirious, doesn't move at all. Seems perfectly rational in every way. And yet that second person is as truly ill as the first person, maybe much more so may have a much more dangerous disease, a more dangerous illness. My point is this, that the illness is common to the two, but the symptoms, the manifestations, the incidentals, differ tremendously from case to case. Now, it's exactly like that in this whole matter of conversion, in this whole question of becoming Christian, so that a Lydia and a Philippian jailer are passing through the same experience with different incidentals, and because the experience is the same, there are certain manifestations that are always present. Now then, we are discussing the case of this man, Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. And we have come to this point. We've been considering the things that kept him from becoming a Christian. And then we moved on to consider what it was that happened to him that turned him into a Christian. And it was this thing that happened on the road to Damascus. What happened? Well, we've considered it like this. The first thing we said was that he was arrested. Suddenly, there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What happened to him? Well, he was brought face to face with himself. He was addressed. Instead of he being the great subject that was examining the object, he became the object that was being addressed and spoken to. He was being dealt with, and he was brought face to face with himself. I don't go over that again. I simply say this that it is impossible for anybody to become a Christian without coming face to face with himself and seeing and knowing himself as he is for the first time. It's invariable. If you haven't come to a knowledge of yourself and your sinful condition, well, my dear friend, whatever else you may be, you are not a Christian. You can't be a Christian without seeing yourself as a sinner. Then last Sunday night we came to the next thing, which was this. He came face to face with this Lord. Having been addressed by the voice, he turned and he said, Who art thou, Lord? He didn't know who was addressing him. He knew this much, that it was somebody who was very great and very wonderful. He says, Who art thou, sir? He knew he was someone whom he could address as sir, as Lord. He didn't know who he was. And back came the, supply, the reply that shattered him. The last thing he ever expected to hear I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. He came face to face with Jesus Christ. He came face to face with the whole fact of the resurrection, uh, of the incarnation, of the life of our Lord, the death upon the cross, the resurrection, and all that it meant and involved. We went into that last week. And again, that is absolutely essential, inevitable, invariable. No man can be a Christian without coming face to face with Jesus Christ and without knowing that he is the Lord of glory who came on earth to die for us men and our sins and to reconcile us to God. Oh, yes, yes, you can be a good person without that. You can have an experience without that. You can have an emotional change in your life without that. But you'll never be a Christian except that it's absolutely in terms of coming to know this Lord of glory, Jesus of Nazareth. I am Jesus. And now this evening we go on. 
we go now to look at some of the consequences that happen as the result of this amazing encounter. It was an encounter. Here's the man Saul of Tarsus. He meets, he hears the voice, he sees the face. And he receives the reply. He's met him. That's the vital thing. But what does that lead to? Now I'm calling attention to this in order that we all may test ourselves. That we may prove ourselves, examine ourselves, and make certain that we really are Christians. I'm going to suggest to you that the things that happened to Paul as the result of that meeting happened to every single Christian. They must happen. They're inevitable. Now, here they are. They're given us in this sixth verse. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now, those of you who've got the revised version in front of you may be surprised that I'm preaching on this text because you haven't got those words in your revised version. That's simply a matter of different texts. There is no question but that what I'm reading to you out of this authorized version literally happened to the apostle. This isn't imaginary. The whole context suggests it. And as you noticed in that reading again from the 16th of Acts, it's something that happens in every case in some shape or form. You notice that these, this very term trembling was used in connection with the Philippian jailer. And he wasn't trembling because of the earthquake. He was trembling after he found out that the prisoners were all there and that there was nothing wrong in that sense. He was trembling at the whole situation and at his conviction of sin. Very well then, let me call your attention to these things. The first thing I want to note is this element of astonishment. And he trembling and astonished said, the apostle was astonished. And why was he astonished? Well, there is no doubt at all that he was astonished at the unexpectedness of it all. At the surprise uh, at what had taken place. This astonishment. The apostle Paul never got over this. And that is why I'm emphasizing and calling attention to it. I'm laying it down as a postulate that a man can't become a Christian truly without being astonished. Mark you, I'm putting it in that way for this good reason, that again my doctrine is that when a man becomes a Christian, what is happening is that God, through the Holy Spirit, is doing something in the depths of his soul and of his being. When a man becomes a Christian, it's not simply that he decides to do something. It's God doing something to him. And the, what, what God does to him is described in the terms I've already implied. He is born again. Born of the Spirit. This miraculous thing, this marvelous thing that our Lord, you remember, spoke to Nicodemus about. And Nicodemus was trying to understand it. And our Lord said to him, give up trying to understand Nicodemus. What I'm talking about is like this. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou canst not tell whence it cometh, nor whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. My dear friends, becoming Christian, I say, it means this. That you have received the divine nature. That you receive and become a partaker. In some mysterious, mystical way that I can't understand, of the very being of God, you're a new creature and a new creation. Can such a thing happen to you without your being astonished? Can you pass from death to life without being amazed? Every spectacle, everything remarkable always astonishes us. I suggest to you that there is nothing bigger, more amazing and astounding than the change that takes place in a soul when such a soul becomes a Christian. Because nobody's born a Christian. I don't care what country you're born in. I don't care who your parents were, nor how Christian they were. Nobody is born a Christian. We are born in sin. We are shaped in iniquity. We all need and must be born again. That's the teaching of the scripture. 
And when I say that takes place, it's so profound that the, that the subject of it is astounded and astonished, even as the Apostle Paul was. Well, now, what were the causes of his astonishment? Well, let me suggest some of them to you. He was astonished, of course, at the complete reversal of all he'd ever known and all he had ever thought. I said that he never got over this. Listen to him years later, writing about it to the Corinthians and saying, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Well, a man who can say that is a man who's astounded. He's astonished. He's in a new world. And he's dazzled. He's amazed. He's astounded. And he, trembling and astonished, said, He was astonished, if you like, at finding himself as he now was. And this, to me, is one of the most remarkable things about the Christian position. When a person becomes a Christian, everybody is astonished. But nobody is more astonished than the person himself. I rather like to define a Christian like this. At any rate, it is to me one of the most delicate and sensitive tests as to whether we are Christians or not. I put it in this form. Are you amazed at yourself? Do you wonder at yourself? Have you become an astonishment to yourself? Have you become an enigma and a puzzle and a problem to yourself because of what's happened to you? That's what would happen to Paul, and he never got over it. Listen to him putting it in writing to the Galatians. I'm never tired of quoting this because it expresses this aspect so perfectly. I live, says Paul, and then at once he corrects himself. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now there it is in a nutshell. I live, uh, yet not I. I, I. I don't understand myself there. There's something's happened to me. I'm two men, and I'm yet myself. I am. I am Saul of Tarsus. I, I'm still the same man. I was brought up in Tarsus. I remember the city so well. I was the little boy who played at his mother's knee. I was the little boy that showed brightness and intelligence, and they said he must be a Pharisee. I was sent up to sit at the feet of Gamaliel. I, yes, I am that man. I, I'm the man who hated Christ and all connected with him. I'm the man who persecuted his cause. I am still Saul. I'm still Saul. Of course I am. And yet I'm not. I live yet not I. I am myself. I'm not myself. Oh, no, no. I, I'm not the same man. I'm entirely different man. Everything about me is different. Although I'm still Saul, I look at myself in the mirror. I see the same face. And yet I'm a new man. I'm a different man. I'm amazed. I can't get over myself. There is about this, this mysterious element. And it's inevitable because it's the work of God. You see, a man who turns over a new leaf and decides to live a better life, he's not astonished like that. There's no cause for such astonishment. But when a man finds himself different, when a man is conscious that something has taken place within him, that God has so dealt with him that he is different and doesn't understand it all, well, then he must be astonished. And that is what happens to the Christian. The apostle never got over this mystery. This marvel as he looked at himself and realized who and what he was and what he once had been. Oh, my dear friend, let me plead with you to apply this test to yourself. If you can give me a full explanation of yourself, I say again, you may be many things, but you're not a Christian. It is an essential part of the Christian that he's aware of a presence and of a power and of an event. That he eludes his understanding, but he knows it's a reality and a fact. The biggest and the profoundest thing in his experience. Astonished. Amazed that you are what you are. 
amazed that you're doing what you're doing. And there is this man on the road to Damascus with everything changed in a flash. He's astonished. Of course he is. He must be. But I think he was astonished also at himself. And I mean in especial now his past. And oh, how true this is to every person who becomes a Christian. He was astonished at his own past ignorance. He was astonished at his own past arrogance. He was astonished and amazed at his own daring character, his own blasphemous character. Well, I'm not saying that about him. He said that about himself. He said that he was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an injurious person. And now he looks at that old self and he can scarcely believe it. He was astonished. He was astonished at his folly. He was astonished at his blindness. And especially his blindness to the teaching of the Old Testament. For there, as we saw a number of Sunday evenings ago, he thought he really was an expert. He'd studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He really was more proficient in his knowledge of the law than anybody else. There was no question. And yet he suddenly discovers that he was ignorant about it all. He'd never understood it. And now he looks back across that and sees himself as he was. And he's unutterably astonished at himself. Do you know anything about that, my friend? I don't want to press the dramatic element, as I said at the beginning. Oh, but I do press the principle. Because, as I've reminded you, we're all born into this world with an antagonism to God in our minds and in our hearts. And we've thought and we've said things against God. And we've asked our questions. And we've stood up and produced our arrogant arguments. And we have said this and that about God as this man was doing without realizing it. And I say you can't become a Christian without looking back at yourself and being astonished at yourself. Astonished at your ignorance. Yes, still more at your arrogance. At your daring character, that you, a creature passing through this world without any control over life and over your destiny, shouldn't hesitate to pit yourself against the Lord of glory and the God of heaven who might destroy you in a flash. Isn't it amazing that one could ever do such a thing? And yet we've all done it. At the unutterable folly of our Great arguments against Christianity. At the cleverness we thought we were displaying, we look back at it and we see the folly, the unutterable folly of it all. Yes, but let me sum it all up by putting it perhaps in this form. I have no doubt that the apostle was astonished that he could possibly ever have missed this truth. You see, he'd heard of Jesus of Nazareth, He'd heard the reports about him, and yet he hated him and regarded him as a blasphemer. And all the truth that was being preached about him by these so-called Christians, he regarded it not, with, not only with disdain, he regarded it as something that was indeed nothing short of blasphemy against God. He knew the facts, they were all before him, and yet he rejected them and he denounced them, and he thought he was serving God by exterminating the people who preached them. And here he is now on the road to Damascus. He suddenly discovers that it's all simply true and literally true. All that he'd refuted and had argued against so cleverly and had resisted, kicking against the pricks. It's the simple truth and he sees it in a moment. And he looks back and he simply can't understand how he could have been so blind how he could ever have explained away the things he'd been told and the things he'd heard and the thing he witnessed when he saw this stoning of the martyr Stephen and things like that. That brightness in that man's face as he was there addressing the Sanhedrin to start with and the way in which he spoke and the joy on his face and all the glory that was many. And he had been explaining it away. 
Well, he looks back and he says, well, how could I have been such a fool? How could I have missed the thing? It's so plain and obvious. I again know of no better test than that. I've never known anybody who's become a Christian, but that he or she has invariably said that to me in some shape or form. How could I have been so blind? How could I have missed it? Why, my friends, I'll put it in this form to you. I often have to tell Christian people and to advise them to be patient with those about whom they're concerned who are still not Christian. They come to me and they say, you know, I put it before them. I told them. I explained it to them. And they couldn't see it. And they're impatient with them. It's sometimes with a relative or with some very dear friend. The person who's now become a Christian wants the other one, of course, to become a Christian. He or she has now seen the thing quite plainly and goes to the other one imagining that now it's so plain and obvious the other one must see it at once. And the other one doesn't see it. And they say, I felt like boxing his ears. I can't understand how anybody could be so stupid. To which I just say this to them, my dear friend, don't you remember that you were once like that? And then they suddenly remember that they were. I say to them, you've just got to realize and to remember that they are still where you once were. But you see, they're so astonished at themselves now that they can't even believe that it was once two of them. Nobody can pass from darkness to light without knowing that experience in some shape or form. And if you tonight are not amazed and astonished at yourself, forever having failed to see the truth as it is in Christ and him crucified, I can only draw one conclusion. And that is that you've still not seen the truth. Because you didn't start in this world by believing it. You may have thought so, but you don't. We all need to be regenerated before we can believe these things. And the moment we do, we are astonished at our former inability. But let me hurry to another thing. The apostle was not only astonished at himself. I'm sure that I'm right when I say that he was astonished at him. The Lord would appear to him. I dealt with that in general last Sunday evening. I want to go into it a little more in detail and to put it like this. The apostle was astonished at his glorious character. At the brightness. At the glory. At the wonder of it all. He never imagined that there could be such glory, such a person. But there he saw him. Now the degree to which we realize that is something that's very variable. But if you go through your Bible, you will find that the people who come nearest to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ have always testified to this thing. You remember Isaiah the prophet was given a vision. And the moment he saw it, he said, I am a man of unclean lips. He was staggered at the glory, at the transcendent glory of it all. This man, Saul of Tarsus, felt the same thing. When Stephen saw the Lord standing at the right hand of God, his face began to shine. Read the lives of the saints throughout the centuries in the Christian church, and you'll find that to every man to whom the Lord has been graciously pleased to give him, to give some spiritual manifestation of himself, They've all testified about this glory, a sense of brightness. Some of them put it in terms of light, the bright shining of a light, an ineffable glory, something sacred, something holy that they couldn't put into words. They've always felt it. I say once more that the degree and the intensity of this varies a lot. But to some extent there must be some consciousness of this. When you come into the presence of God in Christ and you're aware of a holiness and a glory that your mind cannot reach and that you'd never known before. The apostle was astonished at that. But I am certain that he was equally astonished at the grace and at the mercy and at the love of the Lord. 
I'm certain this is the thing in a sense that astonished him most of all. Having now come to see himself and having seen the Lord, what astounds him now is that the Lord has anything at all to do with him. That in view of what he'd said about him and what he'd done to his followers, that the Lord uh, is prepared to have any dealings with him or is prepared to bother with him at all. And I think the thing, of course, that filled him with amazement was the voice, the tone of the voice, when the Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And the thing, you see, that broke the, this man's heart and that really struck him to the ground, I think, was the sorrow in the voice. Oh, not so much the reprimand, but the complete absence of harshness, a pathos, a sorrow, a sense of tragedy. That face, that glorious, beautiful person looks at him and says, Saul, Saul, wretched man, why? Why are you doing this? What's the matter with you? And all the love and the glory and the grace and the love and the mercy came streaming down upon him as he realized that in spite of what he'd been and what he'd said and done, that Lord whom he'd so persecuted was looking upon him with a face in which benignity and mercy were shining out in a way that he'd never seen in his life. Do you know what it is to be astonished at the grace of God in Jesus Christ? Or do you think that you were worthy of forgiveness and that you deserve it? Do you think forgiveness is you are right? If you do, you're not a Christian. If you think you have a right to be forgiven by God, I say you don't know yourself and you don't know God. And you know nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ. The hallmark of the Christian is just this. That he drops on his knees and he says, "'Tis grace, tis wondrous grace. It's all of grace. What didst thou find in me? That's the request of the Christian. He can't believe it. Now, don't take my word for this. The Lord himself has said it in his well-known parable of the Pharisee and the publican who went up to the temple to pray. You remember the Pharisee stands forward and just tells God what a good man he is. Doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't need it. The other man is so conscious of his sin and his unworthiness that he cannot even lift his face but simply says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's no plea. He simply casts himself upon God's love and mercy. And that, I say, is a characteristic inevitably of the Christian. And you can't be a Christian without it. That you're amazed and astounded at his grace, his mercy and his love. You've no right. No plea. No desert. You realize you deserve nothing but hell. And that you'd have no grounds for complaint if he was sent to hell. And that you are what you are solely by the grace of God. He was astonished at this. That the one he'd so wounded and offended is seeking him. He is looking upon him. He is speaking to him. He is drawing him unto himself. It's the whole essence of the gospel. And then let me hurry to say a word about his patience. The apostle was undoubtedly astonished and astounded at the patience of the Lord. There he is, he said to himself, looking upon me now. And he was looking upon me when I was blaspheming him and persecuting him. He was looking upon me as I left Jerusalem a few hours ago, breathing out threatenings and slaughter with this authority from the high priests to go down to Damascus to exterminate his followers. And what he began to say to himself was this. How could he tolerate me? Why didn't he blot me out of the, fa of the face of the earth? Why didn't he wipe me out of existence? He's seen it all. He's known it all. And yet he's born with it all so patiently. He's waited for me. Oh, my dear friend, this is another inevitable and when a man becomes a Christian and look back, looks back across his life, he asks the same question. 
how could he have borne with me when I turned arrogantly against him and said, no, I'm having my way, not yours. When he warned me through the conscience not to do certain things and I deliberately turned my back on him and said, I'm going to do them. I have a right to do them. And the whole time, perhaps throughout the years, a long life, while he and I were rebelling against him and resisting him and throwing back his offers of love into his face and spitting upon him, he still bore patiently with us. He still went on following us. He wouldn't let us go. We wanted to go. We tried to shake him off. We avoided places of worship. We avoided Christian people. We were determined. We stuck to our own way. And yet he didn't forsake us. He didn't leave us. He followed us like the hound of heaven. O oh, love, that wilt not let me go. The love that follows me in spite of everything that has tracked me to this moment. The patience, the long-suffering of this blessed Lord. The apostle couldn't get over it. He was astonished at it. For he, a man, if anybody dealt with him like that, he would have soon finished him. But the very Lord of glory, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords has seen it all, and yet in his love and his mercy he's waited patiently. What an astounding thing. Do you know anything about that? And then the last thing I want to mention here is this. What I suppose astonished him beyond everything was the realization suddenly that that blessed Lord had not only been patient with him, but had done certain things for him. Again, in a memorable phrase to the Galatians, he puts it all. The Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, the blasphemer, the persecutor, the injurious, the headstrong, willful, arrogant sinner, the intellectually proud man, the man who pitted himself against God's revelation and God's Son. He loved me. And as he staggered up Golgotha beneath the weight of that cruel, heavy cross, he was doing it for me. And as he suffered them to press upon his holy brow that crown of thorns, he suffered it for me. And as they took him and nailed him to the tree, and as I hear them hammering in the nails, and see on his blessed face the agony and the pain and the suffering, I see now that he did that for me even for me, such as I am, such as I was, he gave himself to the pain, the shame, the ignominy, the suffering, the blasphemies connected with it all, the jeering of the crowd, the spitting into his face, everything, all. He gave himself for me, he died, the author of life, the creator of the world. He died, gave his life for me. Suffered himself to be buried in a grave. To go down amongst the very dead. This author of life and of being. And he did it all for me. My dear friend. If you know something like that, you'll be astonished to all eternity. And the moment you realize it, you begin to be astonished. Would you do anything like that for such a creature as yourself? That's the question this man puts. He says, sometimes one is prepared to die for an exceptionally good person. 
But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, he even goes further. If while we were enemies we were reconciled unto God by the death of his Son, how much more shall we be saved by his life? But there's the statement, you see. He died for me, not only a sinner, but his enemy. One who hated him, and who rebelled against him, and who fought against him. He gave himself for me. The apostle Saul of Tarsus changed, become a Christian, was astonished. And astonished at that. At that above everything. I obtained mercy, he said, though I was all that. I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And his mercy was manifested in and through me. So he was astonished not only at himself, but still more at the Lord. And finally, for me to close, he was astonished at the way of salvation. You see, he'd thought until that moment that it was something that a man had to earn by keeping the law, by doing good, by being highly moral, by helping others, by living a good life. He was going to earn it all. And there in a flash he discovered that it was given as a free gift in spite of him and in spite of all he'd been. He's done nothing to merit it. He's played no part in it. It was all done by this Lord to whom he's speaking. And it's given him for nothing freely. By grace are he saved, he says later, through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Free pardon because his punishment has been borne by another. Because God has punished his sins in Christ, he forgives him freely. He is given the positive righteousness of Christ. He is ready to stand in the presence of God because he is clothed, he is robed with the spotless righteousness of Christ. God has put to his account the perfect life of the Lord Jesus himself and he's accounted as righteous and perfect in Christ. All for nothing. That moment, it is all his. And if he lives to be a thousand years, he won't merit any more than he has at this moment. It is all in Christ. Everything. God, he says, hath made him to be sin for us, but not only that. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He's everything. And it is all given to us for nothing. Is it surprising that he was astonished? Do you know, everybody who becomes a Christian is equally astonished. They came into the meeting saying, well, now then, I'm no doubt going to be told by that preacher what sort of a life I've got to live. And if I live that kind of life, I'll become a Christian. And because I've done that, God will forgive me and I'll go to heaven. And to their amazement, they're, so, they're told this. Don't start doing anything because you can do nothing. Don't go out of the meeting deciding that you're going to turn over a new leaf and be a better man. And that as the result of this great effort, eventually, you hope you're going to satisfy God. Nothing of the kind. You are told simply this. That everything you need and infinitely more is already offered you in Jesus Christ. And you have but to take it and receive it. You have nothing to do except to say this. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God. I come. And if you do come, you will know something about this astonishment that Saul of Tarsus experienced on the road to Damascus. Come and begin to feel that astonishment which will grow and increase as long as you're in this world and will be multiplied by infinity when you get to heaven and really see him face to face and begin to understand 
what he really did for you. Come. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.